thank you so much for having me, Leah. Uh, you know, when she asked me, she asked, caught me at the end of uh, Winning Women in January and said, hey, I, I want to talk to you. It's like, okay. And, um, and so she talked to me afterwards. And my first response was, I can't do that. Um, so, and I felt like life is just too messy right now. I'm, I still have too much to fix up in myself to, before I can actually speak to people. But I, I said, you know, I will pray because I've learned. Um, you need to talk to the Lord about the f first and not just give that response. And so I got home and I started praying. And I got the sense after a bit that the Lord was speaking to me that saying, your brokenness is part of the story, and you can't shy away from that. That's not a reason. And then, just right around that time, I read a, a blog post um, on Ann Voskamp's blog post. I don't know if any of you are familiar with her. She's one of my favorite authors. Um, she had a guest, oh no, she was speaking, and she said, um, she shared that she still struggles with self-harm every day, with self-loathing that has threatened her life. Now, I knew her story in a background that she was a cutter. She used to cut herself when she was younger. But that she said that she still struggles with it today, just it hit me. And instead of me thinking like, oh, and losing respect for her, it made me love her more and just made me have a deeper respect for her. And so I read that and I thought, wow, I mean, it's because she's being real. And so I'm coming to you this morning, or this morning, this evening. Sorry, I teach a Bible, I've taught a Bible study, and it's always in the morning. So if I say the morning, that's why I'm still back in that Bible study mode. Um, but, you know, when we are around people who are real, who share really who they are, we're drawn to them. And it's what really builds community between people, builds relationship when we're open and we're sharing about what's going on in our lives and when that's received without judgment and it's given without judgment. And so um, that's why her story is so important because we need to hear these stories so that we find out like, oh, I'm not the only one. Oh, phew. Um, and so I'm sharing my story tonight out of love for the Lord, out of obedience, out of love for you and love for the church and love for the world because I believe... This story that I have to share for you tonight is not just my story. This is the Lord's story. And so I want you to hear what he's done for me because then I want to give it you hope so that he, he can do the same thing for you. I'm nobody special, not of the ordinary, and so I know that he can do things for you as well. So that's why I want to share. So my theme, as you saw maybe on the bookmark, was I am broken but still beloved. So I was born the year of Canada's centennial, and I'll let you do the math, uh, but I was born not perfect. In fact, in the eyes of the world, I was kind of broken. Um, I was born with something called hip dysplasia, which means that it was in my right hip, and that hip socket was not formed properly. And so it took a while for them to catch it, and on my first birthday, actually, I went into the hospital, got a cast from, you know, from here down to the legs, um, and then eventually moved to a brace. And so I actually started learning to walk much, much later than most kids. But I did develop some great upper body strength, hauling myself around with that big cast and stuff. Um, my mom had a second child three years later, uh, my brother Timothy, but he actually only lived five days. Um, he had some severe abnormalities uh, that caused us to pass away. And I found out actually... An, a lot of years later, in fact, I think it was even after my mom had died, maybe, I don't remember, but um, she had a heart condition, and she actually wasn't supposed to have kids. They recommended people with that kind of heart condition, they do not have kids. So when I heard that, I thought, oh, wow, I'm a miracle child, like, wow, thank you, Lord. I, I, felt, I felt this great purpose and this love from the Lord. And so, you know, even though, you know, it kind of left me with this very, very slight limp that you know, people would say, especially if my leg got a little bit tired. Um, but I never saw that as kind of like, well, I was broken. It was a deficit. It was a bad thing. It's just like, okay, that's what happened to me. That, that's fine. Um, I was loved. I was wanted by my parents. My parents adopted my brother Gary when he was two years old and I was four, and I did not like him. I wanted a baby sister. I was very clear on that. They did not give me a baby sister, so I did not like him. In fact, for years, even when I was a teenager, I'd ask my mom for a baby sister, and finally she said to me, go have your own children. 
Uh, of course, not at 16, though, right? Wait. Um, both my parents were Christian, and so I actually was raised going to church in a Lutheran church. And um, I learned very early on that for salvation, I needed to believe in Jesus, in his death, in his resurrection. And I believed that with a childlike faith. I did. I don't have that moment, you know, when my mom sat down with me at four years old and prayed with me, that kind of story. It just, I came to believe Jesus. In grade eight, I was confirmed in the Lutheran church, though I didn't actually understand what it meant, what it was all about. I thought it was just kind of like preparation so I could take communion, and so I'd be seen as an adult in the church. And it was years later that I discovered that it actually was supposed to be a confirmation of my infant baptism and a confirmation of my own personal faith. Like, oops, I missed that. Um, my faith actually, I don't think, really came alive until I was about grade 11. Um, I went to a youth conference in Edmonton with New Creation Ministries, and I heard for the first time about spending time with God and reading the Bible. And kind of what just happened was like, I believed in Jesus, but it kind of just came much more alive, more like heart knowledge in me. And I started to read my Bible, and I started to grow spiritually as I learned to pursue and know God. I did have a very different struggle, though, growing up. That really plagued me for a lot of years of my growing up and even into my adult years. Something that I really hated about myself. Something that made me feel very, very broken. I was extremely, embarrassingly shy and fearful. Um, today, we would probably call it, well, she has social anxiety. But there was no name for it like that. It was just you were really shy. And so I would get, you know, when encountering especially new situations, like, you know, we'd go out for supper, go to a movie, or, you know, some kind of social outing, I would get my so anxious, so worked up, my stomach would hurt, and then I'd get sick. And so my parents would end up having to cancel their plans. Sorry, I got lost. Oh, there it is. <laughs> They'd have to eventually cancel their plans and just... Yeah, okay, well, I guess we're not doing that tonight. Eventually, my parents learned that if they didn't tell me what we were, we're just going to go out. If they just told me that, not telling me what it really was we were doing, I seemed to be better with that. And I didn't have that time to get anxious. But what I really wish they would have done is that they would have sat down with me and talked through me about what I was feeling anxious about and, like, why are you so shy? Why? I mean, not necessarily worded that way, but, you know, what is it that's causing you? Talk about it. Oh, I know that, and try to understand. But instead, they would just kind of get exasperated and angry. Um, sometimes, you know, they just force me to go do something, like making phone calls were absolutely terrifying. And so they'd say, no, just go do it. Go do, pick up the phone. And I'd be... Uh, shaking and and it really it made me angry at them sometimes I understand though that they did the best that they could I I'm not angry with them for it I just I wish they would have done it differently but they didn't know any better um, and so I grew up really feeling like I couldn't talk to my parents about problems or fears that I had and so I just kind of kept everything inside well eventually I, I outgrew that vomiting stage thank goodness but I found new ways to cope that weren't necessarily helpful. So I would turn to things like food to comfort or to watch TV or I would just avoid situations or I ignore, ignore people. Okay, so this is one of my tactics. You know, I'd be coming in a group, I'd be standing here and some people I knew would come up behind me and I'd be like, you know, panicking inside like I don't know what to say to them and I'm slow and shy and embarrassed and so I'd kind of turn myself just slightly to pretend I didn't actually know that they were there. Um, you know, and then I'd go home and I'd like, oh, why'd you do that? Like, and I would beat myself up about it. There were so many opportunities that I missed because I was just too anxious to join in. And I hated feeling so scared and panicky. I felt a lot of shame for being like this, but I just couldn't seem to help it. And I didn't even know how to change it. However, you know what, God was still working little things for me in such amazing ways. I had this love for music, and my parents actually started me in piano lessons, which is amazing that, you know, I could actually feel okay to do that. They had tried with accordion lessons the year before, and I just like, nope, got sick. I'm kind of glad, actually. <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended, offended any accordion players out there, but... 
Um, I really love to play the piano. Not a great practicer, but I loved playing the piano. And music is kind of where I flourished. And in junior high school, I could hardly wait to join the band. And so I played clarinet from grade 7 all the way to grade 12. And this other opportunity opened up for which, again, I'm so thankful for. And that was when I was about 13, about grade 8 or so. Um, one Sunday, our church didn't have an organist. So they called me that Sunday, or, you know, came, talked to me as I got to church and say, hey, we, we don't have an organist. Can you play for me? Play for us. And I'm, uh, okay. I, I said I would. And my mom sat with me, thankfully, and we kind of worked through it. Remember, this is a Lutheran church. It's liturgical, so there's lots and lots of music in it. And uh, it was scary, but I made it through, and I actually started my ministry of being church organist and ended up actually becoming the head church organist. organist. Um, I eventually also started playing for Sunday school, piano, and even leading a small children's choir. In grade nine, sorry, my knees are just like shaking. <laughs> it's like, I don't know why. In grade nine, we were in school, we were assigned to research two different careers, and so I chose veterinarian, because I loved animals, and a band teacher. And so I interviewed my band teacher, and I found as I talked with her, I really wanted to be a band teacher. I loved music, I loved instruments, and I loved teaching. So interestingly enough, even though I really struggled to talk to people, I had no problem standing in front of a group and leading or speaking. So something like this, like, you know, I feel, you know, my knees will feel a little shaky, but I'm not, like, terrified. Um, the Lord has just given me that ability to do. But to speak one-on-one -on -one with people was like, I'm going to die kind of feeling um, because I couldn't predict what they were going to see. See, if I'm up front here, I can control what I'm going to say, and I can think ahead of time of what I'm going to say. In fact, it's like it's all written down. Um, but I can't control what the other person's going to say, what they're going to ask me, or, you know, what if there's that awkward pause and I don't know what to say after that? Like, that just terrified me. And, or that I would really blush. Oh, I blushed so easily. And, and then I'd get embarrassed that I was embarrassed. And I, I just had no confidence in conversational skills unless I really, really knew the people. So I did start working towards being a band teacher. And uh, I started taking clarinet lessons so I could be able to play into university. I realized years later that I really didn't talk to God about it. I didn't say, hey, God, what would you like me to do? It just seemed to be what my heart and passions were leading me to do. And I really believe that God was just kind of quietly birthing that, that desire in me. And I'm so thankful for that. A few years ago, um, I was at uh, some training for Saskatoon Pregnancy Option Center. And I have some lovely friends from there here tonight, too. And we did this exercise that was, the purpose of it was to help people figure out kind of what to do with their lives. And there was a few questions. I only remember two of them. One of them was, what did you really love when you were a child? You know, say between the ages of 8 and 10. And my answer was, music. <laughs> Big surprise. And the second question is, what do you think the world's greatest need is besides love? And my answer was, to belong. I feel like it's so important that we just have to have that feeling of being part of something, of being important to people. And so when I started processing this, I realized being a band teacher fit. Now, that this was a year, number of years after I, I quit because I got married and stuff, but I wasn't teaching anymore. But I realized that fulfilled that purpose, those two things there. And again, wow, God knew what I needed. It was awesome. I did have friends over these struggling years, but most ended up moving after a few years. And so I was always having to make new friends. And this was very hard on me. I desperately wanted a friend who would stick around so I could do things with, someone I could share my deepest thoughts with and struggles with. After high school, I entered the University of Calgary's music program, and it was during these years that my fears and anxieties grew actually stronger, especially by my fourth year of university. But again, God was taking care of me and my brokenness and showing me that I was beloved, I was his beloved, though I couldn't see it. It actually all started on my very second day of university in my first year. I was standing in one of those many lineups. I don't know if they do that nowadays, my daughter's first year. But it seemed like you had to stand in the lineup for this and this and this and this and this. And so one of those lineups, someone from Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called Power to Change, 
But they handed me this little short questionnaire that was asking me about my beliefs in God. And so I filled it out. And the last question asked, would you like to be part of a Bible study? And I thought, mm, sure, that would be great. And so I began those years in university being part of Campus Crusade for Christ. I met Allison, who was one of the student leaders there, who shared with me her journey of being shy. And that really encouraged me. She talked about shyness as being like locked up in a clam, like a clamshell. While it was really safe inside, it was very lonely. And I keenly felt this loneliness. Sometimes, you know, one of the girls from the group would invite me out to go for coffee or have me over for dinner, that sort of thing. And I would go, but I would always feel so terribly uncomfortable and unable to open up and just to be really myself. And being in group meetings was worse. I could be at the meeting, but you know, at the beginning, you know, everybody's kind of chit-chatting. And then when it's finished, everybody's chit-chatting. And I couldn't join those groups. I just felt so paralyzed with fear. And I would just, and I would hate that about myself. And then I'd beat myself up. And it just, I couldn't handle it. And so I just, I, as soon as the meeting was done, I'd just go home. And then I'd cry sometimes on the way home and, and that. Um, and I started having this thinking, well, you know, people should know I'm shy and they should come to me. Like, I shouldn't have to join them. They should come to me. And that didn't seem to happen. And so I felt even more rejected. And I just desperately wanted one close friend who could open, I could open up to. And so I started crying out to God again and again, God, change me. God, you've got to change me. God, change me. Please change me. I was so locked in fear and anxiety and so lonely and so filled with pain. Now, understand, I'm talking about my brokenness, and I, I don't want to minimize. I know some of you probably have experienced brokenness far beyond what I ever felt. And, and so I don't want you to, you know, kind of, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It's just, it's easy for us to compare our brokenness with each other and say, well, like, you know nothing about brokenness. Or for me to say, to you, you don't know anything about my brokenness, but God doesn't ask us to compare brokenness, but to, to share our brokenness. And so things changed, though. One day, September of 1988, well, I was on the city bus going to school in my fourth year of university. And I was thinking about the night before when I had been at a Campus Crusade prayer meeting and I had talked to no one again. And I cried out to God and I pleaded again with him to change me. And suddenly, I heard this voice, this audible voice in my head. And I heard what I believe is the voice of the Lord that said, I will change you. I knew this was the Lord speaking to me. And immediately, I was filled with peace and joy. And this is the only time he's ever spoken to me that clearly. It was a very special intimate moment with the Lord and I felt like he had heard me at that moment and changes did start to come just little tiny ones like coming out of a class or meeting and, and walking with somebody that I didn't even know and we just talked like for a few seconds even and just little things like that that just started to show me like God is God's working he's working however the biggest event that happened was about seven months later when my old high school band teacher called me up and said, hey, I, I need an extra clarinet player for our band trip to Toronto, and would you like to come with us? Well, I wrestled with that idea because uh, first, well, I was supposed to be going to a youth conference, you know, the one that I'd gone to in grade 11. I continued to go to them, and I was supposed to go to that conference that weekend, and David Meese was going to be there. Now, I don't, you young people are like, who's he? I don't know. But David Meese was going to be there, and I was, like, so pumped about this concert. But the second thing was, I was going with a group of people. I didn't know anybody other than the band teacher, and frankly, he intimidated me a bit. I loved him, but his greatest joy was embarrassing students. And he did that on a few occasions with me in, in high school. <clears throat> and so it could have the potential of being, like, really bad, lonely, and awkward. But I prayed always pray and I did feel the Lord's leading to go to this trip and so I did go and there were a few practices before the trip and the very first one 
this girl comes up to me at the end of practice and, and doesn't even say hi. She just says, are you Christian? She kind of took me aback. And I said, yes, are you? <laughs> yes. Her name is Julie. And we hit it off. I don't know what happened. Something tweaked in there. And we hit it off. And we fast became very close friends. We spent a lot of time together on that trip and continued on after that. She was that dear friend, that kindred spirit I was looking for and who was a catalyst for the greatest change in my life. So even just this week, as I was thinking about this and what was all been going on, I realized that it wasn't just in that moment, but God had been doing preparation in my life even before he brought Julie along. He started by quietly renewing my mind, changing the way that I was thinking about myself and thinking about other people. I didn't realize it, but as I look back now, that's what he was doing. He was bringing truth to my mind like... Um, Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And 2 Timothy 1.7, that says, For I did not give you a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-control. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second here. Sorry if you had my swallowing noises there. <coughs> These scriptures, I knew them, but they were starting to take plant and root in my heart, and I started to believe them. He did this without me actually even really realizing it. And I really believe that had Julie come in the earlier, it, it well, wouldn't have worked. It would have been like all the other attempts of people coming to me. But he brought her just at the right time. There's a song that I recently learned that we've been singing here at The Rock that's called Waymaker. It's a great song. If you don't know, look it up. But there's a bridge part that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. And even, even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Philippians 1.6 says, I'm confident that the creator who has begun such a great work among you will not stop in mid-design, but will keep perfecting you until the day Jesus, the anointed, our liberating king, comes to redeem the world. That's from the voice translation. And then in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. The Amplified expands that little part, says, and he says he strengthens, he energizes, he creates in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasures. So God was at work changing me in ways that I couldn't even see or even expect. Another one of the startling changes was a stirring to go to Bible school. I had noticed that many of the people from, from Campus Crusade had gone to Bible school and seemed to know their Bible so well. And I felt a desire to go, but I was kind of worried that you know, I was doing my music degree and then I had an education degree. If I kind of took a year off to do Bible school, would employers kind of go like, why did you take that year away from your student teaching? And not, like, you know, that would be a detriment to me. Um, and so I was kind of worried about that. I wasn't sure what to do. Well, Julie had gone off to Briarcrest after she had graduated from high school, and I was doing my student teaching in Calgary. And I did decide through that year that, you know what, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to go to Bible school. And, and so I went with Julie, and we were roommates for that year. And it was a totally awesome year of learning. I mean, not easy. There was challenges. But I grew in my knowledge in, in the Bible, but I grew mostly in my relationship skills. I learned so much from Julie, and then from my new friend, who was Bonnie, who was the next door neighbor to me. I mean, I was the one, I actually went to her door and knocked and said, hi, I'm Carolyn. That wasn't, that, the old me never would have done that. Never. And so this was God at work. And we had this group of friends that we hung out with. And I came home a changed person. God was so good. Well, coming home, I finished my last year of university. And then I started applying for jobs. And finally, actually, one came up open for Prairie Bible Institute in, in Three Hills, Alberta, teaching music to their grade 5 to 12 students. It turned out that going to Bible school was a benefit in getting that job. Ha! Thank you, God. 
thank you. I'm so glad that I, I, I was obedient there. I'd listened and I'd obeyed. And he prepared me for this. And I got to teach there for eight years. Incidentally, in my first year or two of teaching, David Meese came and did a concert there. <laughs> I was like, yes, I've got the smile of God on me. It was awesome. It was a really cool concert. He actually broke a piano pedal. I've never seen that happen before. <laughs> and I had to stop the concert and change out the pedals. Anyway, I really did enjoy teaching, though I did struggle with classroom discipline. That was my downfall. But I still did struggle with some loneliness there. Julie was still back at Briarcrest, and then eventually she got married, and we kept in touch. But, um, but there was a new struggle that was starting to take over, and that was a loneliness because I was single. So my, and many of my friends had gotten married, but not I. I hadn't even had a boyfriend. And when friends were dreaming of their weddings, I could not. It was too painful, and I couldn't even see if God had a plan for me in that. Um, you see, though God had really changed me, I was still incredibly locked up in anxiety when it came to men. Especially if I liked them or, you know, had a bit of a crush on them or something. I just, I couldn't handle it. My bad coping skills came out again and, and just kept me locked in a lot of fear and shame. God did eventually, I got, eventually got to know some teachers there, fellow teachers, and we had a group that hung out. Um, a friend from Calgary um, that I'd grown up in church, my friend Pauline, um, we kind of reconnected again, and we, she was a, a great friend to me, still is to this day. Um, and God gave me this amazing roommate, Rose. She was the grade one teacher. And we uh, lived together for six years. And little did we know we were actually preparation for each other for marriage. You see, at finally some point in time in our years together, we started praying. She was actually a few years even older than me. And we started praying for each other weekly about our singleness. Praying that God would bring a man to both of us at the same time so nobody was left alone. You laugh, but that was a serious thing. We did not want one of us getting married and then the other one having to watch this painfully. I'm still single and you're getting married. And you know what? It took you two years of praying, but God brought us both men. And we got married three weeks apart. So... God is awesome. In fact, my husband is back there. He's standing up in front of the sound booth. He's the guy who's been wandering around with the camera. That's him. So you see, God knew my struggle. He knew my brokenness, my anxiety, my fear, my weaknesses. And he brought a man to me and in the way that I could handle it. My friend Julie, who was living in Saskatoon at that time, she was married. She already had three kids. She was talking with one of her friends one day who said, hey, I know this guy named Bob. And they decided to match make. So Julie met him and thought he was a pretty good guy. And she gave him my email address, gave him my email address with my permission. And we began a relationship through email. Now, this is before texting. There was no texting at that time. And so it was email. And phone calls cost lots. So it had to be through email. Email gave me time to think about what to say, how to open up at my speed. I could blush without him seeing. We started emailing December 4th of 1999, met for the first time at the end of January of 2000. We were engaged by May of 2000 and married September 16th on 2000, one month before my 33rd birthday. It was fast. It was miraculous. But you know what? We were older. We knew what we wanted. We were mature. I was beloved, I was beloved by God and by Bob. Bob was from Ontario, and he moved to Saskatoon in 1996 to pastor a church. And so when we married, I instantly became pastor's wife. Well, you know what? As a pastor's wife, you got to talk to people. You have to be in situations that you don't always feel comfortable with. Had that happened 10 years er earlier, no way. It would not have worked. I wouldn't have been able to handle that kind of job. And so again, God was working in me quietly, silently, without even me knowing. And I, when I stepped into that role, I mean, it wasn't perfect. I know there's a couple ladies here who knew me from back those years. I was not a perfect pastor's wife, but God gave me the grace to be able to do that. And my ministry changed from ministry to kids to ministry to women in the church. Um, we stayed on in there until this, about the spring of, of 2008. Bob, oh, sorry, I, I skipped a whole section here. We had two kids. 
Um, my daughter Danae boarded. <laughs> Especially my daughter's here. I can't skip over that. My daughter, Danae, born in uh, December 2001, 2001, when I was talking to Rose, I kept saying January, January. It's like, no, December. <laughs> and then our son, Caleb, who's at home with her puppy dog, uh, born in June 2003. And neither had hip dysplasia, thankfully, because that can be passed on. Um, in 2008, Bob approached me about moving on, feeling that his work was done here, and I prayed for a few weeks about it, and I felt the Lord's release. We were hoping to get a church in the States to be closer to Bob's mom, because she's an American, and she, at that time, she was living in the Phoenix area, but nothing opened up. We stayed on until the church found a new pastor in May of 2009, and then we entered a time of God's silence. There was no place to go, no going back. We were stuck here, not knowing what to do. And it was a difficult time of not knowing. I'm looking at my time and realizing I'm running out of time. So this always happens. Bible study, I was like, ah, I have so, so much. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to take out a part. And just to say that time was amazing because at that time, my hip was starting to have problems again. It was dislocating. I had to have surgery. It happened. The timing of it and everything was amazing how God, we left that position, and a week later, I had surgery, and boom, bang, it just, and I needed Bob at home, because I couldn't get out of bed, and couldn't get out of a chair, even, by myself, and it was just like, wow, God, you couldn't have timed that better. So, you know, God had been teaching us all along, just to trust, wait on me, and so even though his silence was really hard, he was there taking care of us. So finally, Bob got a job with Horizon College and Seminary, and he's been there the past 10 years. He's teaching. He's the dean of students there. And so we come to the present time today. And I have to say that the past two years, two, almost three years, have probably been the hardest ones of our lives. And it's probably why I said, hey, life is too messy to share right now. Um, but you, you know what? We're never going to reach that state of perfection where everything is totally perfect. You know, yes, I have those parts of my stories where, like, I was dying of singleness and God brought me a husband. And, like, wow, great. You know, but we don't always have everything that works up so beautifully and neatly like that. We still have messes and brokenness and things that we're in. But to God, he does things in his timing. And if we've got the patience to wait it out, Right. So this period actually started about March 2017, and I started receiving phone calls from people in, in Calgary, my dad's friends, that saying, hey, you know what, we're really concerned about your dad. And so, so my mom had passed away in 2002. He'd been alone for 15 years, and he was 92. He's still living on his own, totally active man, but he had had prostate cancer for a number of years. And so I went to visit him several trips, and I realized he is not doing good. In fact, I found out that this cancer clinic had actually told him the previous summer, you have about six months left. He didn't tell me that. Um, and so they were saying, you know, you should move into hospice care. And he didn't really want to because he's an independent man. And, and he finally decided to do that. And it actually it turned out to be the very best decision because people could come to visit him and just that they couldn't have done that if he was at home. And through all that time, I just, you know, I was worried. I wanted to be with him, but I, I needed to be with my family and that struggle back and forth. And I'm just like, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I kept feeling him say to me, I've got this. I've got this. I'm like, okay, okay, I can relax. Um. He was only there 11 days in hospice care, and then he passed away. And I didn't get to be there when he was, when he passed away. Um, I didn't get to be there with my mom either, but you know what? I really believe that was God's plan. It was God's best. Actually, my dad died the same day that my mom died, just 15 years later. It was like, that's so freaky. Oh, he was, well, I don't know if he was just waiting for that day. I think he was. The real challenge came, though, two days later. My brother and I were in Calgary. They're arranging my dad's funeral, and Bob and the kids were still in Saskatoon, and they were going to come in a few days. And I got a phone call from Bob. The school had called him. Uh, kids go to Saskatoon Christian School, and they told him. They had discovered that our son Caleb had been struggling with some very serious, very dark, self-harming kind of thinking. 
I knew that he'd been somewhat different the last year, but I thought he was just being a moody teenager. You know how they can be. But we found out that he'd been really quietly struggling with a really deep depression. And this came as a huge shock to us. So I was mourning my dad, and I was six hours away from my son, who could, was deeply struggling, and I couldn't even be there with him. And every time that anxiety would rise, like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with him? Like, I would again, God, say, I've got this. I've got this. And I would be filled with this peace. And so all summer, we dealt with my dad's estate, cleaning out his house, getting it ready for sale. He was a huge pack rat. Oh. Oh. Anyway, I... 50 years, over 50 years of accumulation. I'll just leave it at that. And so finally on my last trip to Calgary that summer, I was there by myself to get rid of some more stuff. I felt this enormous weight of my dad's death and my son's deep struggle. And my husband was struggling too because he was now the executor of that will and he was working full time and he is working on a master's degree program, still is. And it was hard. And it's like, God, I don't even know how much more I can take of this. And I cried out to him, and again, this time he, he said something, but he didn't say, I've got this. He said, I've got you. It was a different message. I've got you. See, no matter what happens, if the very worst happens with any of them, I've got you. I'm holding your heart. I've got you, and you'll be okay. This carried me through. And you know what? It still carries me through to today. I still struggle time to time with some mild social anxiety, but for the most part, I can overcome it. God gives me the strength to, to overcome it, to actually go to people and talk to them. I no longer wait, well, like, they should know I'm shy and come to me. I just go to them. I find the shy ones, and I go to them. Not always. And if I haven't, I, I, I apologize. I'm not perfect at that. My son still struggles, struggles with depression and dark days. My husband still has this stressful job and doing his master's program. And, and my daughter has gotten some of my anxiety as well. I worry about my kids and their problems, which are much bigger than skin knees and broken toys. I worry about their own faith journey and about the mistakes they've made or the mistakes they can, could potentially make. I worry, you know, about if they're gonna, are they going to follow Jesus? Are they going to... Are they going to follow in his footsteps, making him their savior? And some days, I just don't know how the day is going to start and how it's going to end. And I live with fear of what ha could happen to my family. It's the fear of the unknown. It's the fear of brokenness in me and in them. You see, God taught me in the past to rely on him, that he's got me, that he's got this. But now the lesson I'm learning to learning is that He's got them, that God's taking care of my family. You see, I can control myself. Well, kind of, you know, sort of, you know what I mean? You're like, I have responsibility over my own choices, but I have none over them. I can, you know, force my kids to clean the bathroom, but I can't, well, sort of. <laughs> um, but... I can't force him to think a certain way or to do certain things. I can't force my husband to do this and that. I can't do that. And so I've had to learn to let go and let God take care of it. You see, I have still many areas of my life besides anxiety that need a mind reset. My thinking renewed. I love to procrastinate. I'm prone to laziness. I have a bit of a temper. I am not very good at keeping goals. And I watch too much TV, Facebook, and I have other sinful habits. But God is patient with me, and he's still working in me. And he still amazingly calls me his beloved, and that's grace. You see, he changed my own thinking, which was based on lies. Things like, I'm unlovable, I'm helpless to change, I'm unworthy. I thought I was saving myself from suffering by staying in my little safe clamshell, but it actually was harming me more, suffocating me. And to live out of that clamshell, letting others see my brokenness, my mistakes, it felt actually like death. Like not literally death, but it would mean death in some way or another. And my surprise, though, is that, you know, even though I did something and I feel like I'm going to die if I do this, I always found out at the end, it's like, oh, well, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. It was exposed as a lie. God had to change my old way of thinking. Romans 8, 6 says, For the mind set of the flesh is death, 
Anytime I'm not thinking the way that God does, it's a death. It's leading to death, actual spiritual death. But the mindset controlled by the spirit, it finds life. It finds peace. So to start changing, I had to start asking God to renew my mind. And I still have to do that daily. God, renew my mind. Otherwise, I get trapped into old ways of thinking and acting. You see, anxiety actually often is the belief that God is not enough. When I start believing, and it, you know, it's not like I, oh God, I don't believe you're enough. It's just that, that little thing inside, that self-unconscious thing. I start believing that God can't do this. He's not enough. That's when my anxiety hits. Um, Anne Voskamp, in, in a blog post that she had, January 3rd, um, it was actually somebody else that wrote this, said, when we mentally obsess about the future and try to live out a moment before we're in it, we a anticipate what that moment might feel like without the benefit of God, the grace of God. We assume it will be difficult, and we haven't even done anything yet. The grace of God we need to do anything in life will be available exactly when we need it. Overanalyzing our lives or letting our imagination run wild will never create peace. Rest is where we place great faith in our great God. Rest means what we're resting in what is happening right this moment, this second, with a complete trust that God will meet us in the next moment. So, we need to ask God when we're struggling in those areas, whether it's fear or any other areas where you're struggling, I think our first step is to ask God, would you renew my mind? Would you change the way that I am thinking? And then to be praying about it. See, anxiety, it actually did serve a good purpose in the sense that it pressed me into Jesus because he was the only one that I could talk to, that I could trust with, with my deepest fears and thoughts. And now, lately, with this fear about my family, he's pressing me into pray more, which I needed to do, because that's all I can do. I can't change him, I can't fix him, but I can pray. So, you know, Philippians 4, 6 to 9, and I don't have time to read it, but just, it says, don't be anxious about things. Pray, with thanksgiving, pray, present your requests with God, and the peace of God will come as you present those things, no matter how silly and ridiculous they are. I'm learning to be totally vulnerable with the Lord. Instead of feeling that anxiety and saying, oh, that's bad, that's bad, get rid of it, I shouldn't be feeling anxious, I'm learning to say, okay, wait a minute, Lord, I'm feeling anxious right now, what is it about? Why am I feeling anxious? And I'm starting to feel it more and recognizing and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know what? I'm feeling anxious because of da 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 this. And then I realized, but that's not true. That's not, that's a lie. God, I am sorry. Would you replace my thinking with the truth? And so I want to leave you with this last thought, that it's, it's okay to be broken. We are all broken. And it's okay. And in fact, it's even better to admit it. Psalm 51, 17, verse B says, A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So if you think, well, I can't come to God because I'm broken. He doesn't despise that. He welcomes it. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. Take your brokenness to him. Share it with him and start that journey of healing. And then I want to ask you, share your brokenness with others. That's where community is built as you start to share your brokenness with each other, I mean, don't just walk up to any Joe and say, hey. Find those trusted people and share your brokenness. It's a gift. It's actually a gift when you say, hey, you know what? I'm really struggling. Because if people see you have no problems, they start to think like, well, I don't want to be her friend because she's too perfect. None of us are. Start sharing your brokenness. In fact, um, I just finished reading Anne Voss's camp, Anne Voss Camp's book, *The Broken Way*, and if you haven't read it, it's a hard read. It's a great read. It's like it takes you a long time. You know, we looked at mine. I've got highlights everywhere. Um, but she talks about like brokenness is actually a gift that we give each other. So. Romans 8, 15 to 16 says, You did not receive a spirit, the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father. 
For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers to our inmost being, you are God's beloved child. I believe that's the voice translation or the passion. I can't remember. I'm sorry. So back to that song I talked about before. He's the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that's who you are. And even when you can't see it, he's working. And even when you can't feel it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. So lean on that truth. I am broken, but still he calls me beloved. And you, you're broken. But the good news, he still calls you his beloved. And he changes you and he works in you and he keeps forgiving you and bringing you back. That's his grace, his love for you. Thank you very much. 